All right, let's welcome Peter Gassner from Viva Systems. Super cool. Peter, thanks for coming. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. So uh, I appreciate you coming. I know you're not on the traditional speaking tour, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. Did you not. miss the Crunchies this year? <laughs> well, Were you able to go? You know, I, don't, I might not even know what that is. You don't even know what it is. <laughs> so this is a great, uh, it's a great content. I mean, Twilio is one of our most like, iconic last IPOs, and Viva is just, uh, it's my favorite success story. So it's fun, fun to share it here. So um, let, me, let me hit a couple highlights on Viva, or actually give us 60 seconds on Viva, and then I'll add a couple other highlights for folks that are in here. Tell, tell us your version of the, the history. The history of Viva, so basics, 10 years old, about 1,700 people. We're building the industry cloud for life sciences. So our customers are people like Pfizer and Novartis, et cetera, that are making medicine to, to help um, improve life. And we provide a variety of cloud solutions for them. So in a nutshell, what we say is, we're building the industry cloud for life sciences, so we want to be essential and appreciated to every CEO in the life sciences industry and help them be more efficient and effective, because what they're trying to do is bring better medicine to people, and we want to help them do that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So we'll get into that. So 10 years old, just about now, we'll come back to that. About a $600 million run rate at this point? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty impressive. What do you guys think? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, um, and started off primarily as pharma CRM, right? And now we've got a couple different products, which we'll chat about in a minute. And what's the suite like today? Well, we have a suite of products. So yeah. started off in pharma CRM uh, 10 years ago, really focusing in there, build this CRM product on salesforce.com. About 2010, we started a completely different product line, this Viva Vault around content management. That makes up about a 35% of our revenue now. And then we have some newer products. Some of our newest products are actually in the data area, where we're generating unique data that the life sciences industry needs. So we're a real multi-product line company now. Um, we didn't start that way, but that's where we are. OK, I want to hit that in a minute, because we, we just talked with Jeff Lawson about his thoughts. And you and I chatted about those before. Um, but, um, but let's go back for a minute. So, the early days. So your background, you were early to just about everything, right? You were early at Siebel. You were VP of technology at Salesforce back in the day? Yeah, VP, that, yeah. Back in the, the, with, the, with, the, with the OG, <laughs> right? And then you came up with the crazy idea to start Viva like in 2007, yeah. um, like just before the worst two years that we've experienced <laughs> in, in the industry, right? 08 yeah. and 09. So we talked before. Tell us a little bit, what, what, what gave you the bug to start Viva? What's the, what's the background story for the company? Well, I think you know, part of it is just how I was born. I never liked to follow the herd. I yeah. think I probably frustrated my parents at times about that. <laughs> I mean, literally, I never liked to follow the herd. I remember coming back in, in first grade and telling my parents, I don't want to learn how to read. I don't think I need to. <laughs> and literally. And my mom, bless her heart, she said, what do you think she said? She said, that's fine, you know. I never met an 18-year-old who didn't know how to read, so I'm sure you'll get there. <laughs> Figured so out one she way was, or the other. <laughs> yeah, she, she knew I was hard-headed. So what I figured, what, what tipped it for me is I realized, man, I can't read the road signs, and I want to know where we're going. Okay, I better learn how to read. So I've never followed the herd, so that's one thing. It's just, I think you're born with it. But the other thing is I've studied enterprise software for literally 30 years. I was an intern at IBM, mainframe software, when I was 20 years old, and that was 30 years ago. So if you take this ability to not follow the herd yeah. and the experience, you can spot trends. Because when you think about it, when a trend is early, everybody thinks you're wrong. That's the definition of being early. So I have this knack of doing that. I'll give a little example of Viva. I had always done you know, general software things, database software on mainframes, PeopleSoft, run that technology group, Salesforce.com platform for everybody. Yeah. And then in 2007, I had this idea, I'm going to make something very specific to an industry, very specific to an industry in the cloud. And I remember sitting down with his friend. He actually drew on a napkin, paper napkin. Look, here's enterprise software. OK, now here's life sciences. That's a very small wedge. And here's pharma CRM. That's like a pinprick. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? You've got so much potential. And that's when I knew, hey, I'm onto something. I think it could be good. Most people think it's dumb. That's a very encouraging thought. So I would say to the entrepreneurs, recognize that. When you get that thing where you're a rational person and you think it'll be great and 
you know, 99 out of 100 people think it's bad, that's when you have opportunity, don't get discouraged. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, I've always done that. I mean, even Salesforce.com in the early days. When did you join Salesforce? Uh, 2002, I guess, or so. All right, yeah. Another terrible time to be in technology. Yeah. <laughs> the and world most, that I ended in 2002, too. And yeah. most people thought that cloud thing would never be big. And I yeah. always remember people asking me, they would start to learn about it. And then at some point, they would say, I get it, I get it. Who are you trying to be like? I was like, yeah. oh, no, you don't get it. I'm not trying to be like anybody. That's the whole point. Uh, so I think it's that, experience and a willingness to not follow the herd. So, and then we, we chatted about this before on the phone. So you start, you leave, you, you, see, you see this white space. It seems small in the beginning, but you know it's there. And how did you know you wanted to be a CEO? Well, I, I didn't, actually. Um, I specifically didn't want to be a CEO. Um, so that's, that's the real story there. I'd retired a little bit after Salesforce.com, and I didn't want to be a CEO. I was a software developer, product person. I thought that's the most creative thing to do. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, happened to be I ran into some folks who wanted to fund me, and I thought, well, that's kind of good. So I can be like the head of products and the CEO. And if it, you know, most startups fail, so I don't have to worry about it. But <laughs> pressure if, was off. Right? Yeah, I mean, but if There's it doesn't no pressure fail, the first six months, is yeah, there? I always thought, hey, if it doesn't fail, then we'll get a CEO. Ah, so that yeah. was my plan. And then, um, you know, it didn't work out that way. We happened to, because actually it's the truth, most startups do flare, fail. You know, if most restaurants that start up fail, most technology companies, that's the odds. Otherwise, you're not being aggressive enough, right? Yeah. You can open a hamburger stand. You know it's not going to fail, but you know you're not going to make a lot of money. So you're, you're most likely going to fail. That's the facts. I thought that was going to happen. But then the unexpected happened. We didn't fail. It really started going. And I started enjoying I thought, man, I really enjoy being a CEO. And I'm pretty good at it. And I, I started feeling I can improve myself enough to remain the CEO. So it was never my plan to be the CEO. Yeah. And where, um, and what percent of your customers today are seven-figure deals and, and up? It's well, balance we, of the revenue, right? Yeah, and balance, balance of the revenue. revenue. We have, you know, not so many customers, less, so many than, less than 500 But that customers. first year when you decided you didn't want to be CEO and you'd see how it goes, how, what was, how did you get the passion around closing those big deals? Oh, I am, uh, I'm competitive, right? I like to do a good job. I like yeah. to do a good job. You feel responsibility for your employees. Um, I, I'm a hard worker, I think most entrepreneurs are, so, you know, I was, I knew the likelihood is it wasn't going to work, but I knew it wasn't going to be because of lack of effort, right? And that's what really matters, so just iterative decisions every day about what product to make, when to cave in to a customer, when not to, who to hire. We always had a quarterly plan. We did not have any plan that extended beyond 90 days in the company in the first year, because I always said, it's irrelevant. Six months from now, we could be out of business. Why do you even want to think about that you or no, talk you about no that? We had no 12-month goal for revenue, customer account. We had, we had only account. quarterly plans, quarterly plan. period, for the first year and a half of the company. Then we graduated for the next two years to an annual plan. Then after that, we have a three-year plan. And then just now, we're starting to you know, do the vaguest of five-year plans. Yes. But it's true. It doesn't matter. Most cases for most startups, the next quarter doesn't really matter. It's this quarter. Yeah. One related point to that, you are sort of legendary in terms of uh, working with customers, providing huge value, and getting, getting good contracts out of them. So what's the secret to know when to walk and how to work, especially in the early days when, when yeah. I mean, now you have the iconic brand, at least in your verticals, but how do you pull that off in the early days? I yeah. was terrible at this. In the early days, you don't have any brand. You tell your customer the company name, and they're like, what? Let me write that down, right? They don't <laughs> know what that is. That is that with trees or one? Yeah, or how, how many spell that in thing? The and, uh, <laughs> you know, I remember this one meeting with a large customer. We're trying to win business, and the guy in the back of the room stood up and said, we have more people in this room than you have in this company. Yes. Why would we ever buy anything from Why you? Why would they? <laughs> and I told him, I mean, you have, those are the moments of truth where where you have to tell the truth, right? You have to say what you believe. And I said what I believed. I said, we have great people, and we're working on great technology. And yeah. that's it. So yeah. that was the reason. And I, so my secret on it is always sell yourself first, 
So when I'm talking to a customer, it may be a negotiation or something like that, or give somebody an employment offer, I will sell myself first. I will really understand what is the price I want for my product. I have apples for sale. I get to set the price of the apples yeah. because they're m my apples. The other person can decide if they want to buy the apples. And so you just understand that. And then, then that way it becomes very simple. It's not actually my problem if it doesn't go through. It's the other person just didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't they see didn't it the right. They wanted the apples. They, huh? they were incorrect. They didn't want to, you know. <laughs> they were incorrect. <laughs> so it's otherwise. It, so I'm never trying to get the most out of something. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to get the right value. The right value. Yeah. But that, that's still a challenge for many of us. Oh right? yeah, we, that's most a of us tend to back off because we don't want to blow the deal. Yeah. We don't want to lose the logo. So I think we all leave a lot on the table until we get help. I leave a lot. Leave it on the table is fine. But selling it for not knowing what you think something is worth, that's not fine. That's not Especially fine. Especially yeah. because when you're making a product, the price you set will determine how good your product is. Right? It's self-fulfilling. It is, se it is self-fulfilling. Yeah, it? because it's the expectation. Am I building a premium product that's great? Well, that should cost a little more, and the money will come in, and you'll just, that's the expectation. Yeah. Of course, this product's, of course, I can't accept anything wrong with this product. Do you know how much we're charging for this? I can't accept anything wrong. This is a premium product. So it just starts I think the that better way. your team is, the more you should anchor high, because you can deliver that, that, that the best solution in the market. Yeah, it starts right. with the CEO, actually. You know, are you going to make something that's great or not? And then if it's great, it must have value, and you have to assign the value. Yeah. Uh, so sure. I guess I've always felt strongly about that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, where we started because I want to I want to dig in on, on sort of multiple products. So you've got three three lines now, right? Mm -hmm. You and I had I want to talk about some of the stuff we talked about before. We had Jeff Lawson from Trulia out here which is throw teams of 5 on it, uh, see if it works, see uh -huh. if it doesn't break. Um, we had yesterday we had uh, the CEO of Trello talking about uh, that's a spin out from a company called Fog Creek and seeing mm -hmm. where it breaks. Um, but you and I, when do you, when do you add a product line, right? Yeah. What's, what's your view on this? Well, so we're in this enterprise software. It's a slightly different, right? We're it is selling, slightly different. selling no to question. these large yeah. customers, and they're really running their business on it. And that, so it's a little bit different. You have to be a little more measured. But what I always think about is a company usually starts up from a product, right? You have a product idea, and wow, I find some product market fit, right? And it starts growing, and then my, my company is my product, and my product is my company. The, the two things are intertwined, and that's the stage. Many, many companies fail or become suboptimal when they break that, when they say, I'm going to really start another product line. Not an add-on product or something like that. But this is like Amazon saying, I'm in e-commerce, now I'm in web services. Yeah, that seemed crazy at the time. Web, web services is not an add-on product to e-commerce, right? So they really, so when you when you decide, I really want to make something big and different. Two things: one is it should be bigger than the first thing you're doing. Yeah, you're that really is just the, I love. And if it's not bigger, is it worth your time? Yeah, is it worth your time? And then you have to realize when you do that, you're breaking apart your product processes from your company processes, and that's super, super, super hard. And it took Viva about three or four years, and it's just persistent effort. And a lot of times you can fail at that. So I think, really realize that. When's the right time to become a, mul a real multi-product company? Pick a clear market that's clearly big. Yeah. You won't know if it's correct until later. There's no way. We say pick clear and correct markets. You won't know if it's correct until later. <laughs> but if you can't write down, this is what I'm making. This is who I'm going to sell it to this is roughly how many people I can sell it to, and this is roughly the price I want to get, then you don't have a clear market. Yeah. So I think it's possible to know if you have a clear market. And correct, I don't worry about because it's impossible to know. Yeah, because we were talking before, it's the easy choice is the, is the, the adjacent product that clearly attaches, but ultimately is a smaller market than your core market, right? That's the, one, that's the, easy, that's that's the, the trap. easy ones to grab. That's the trap, though, It's right? the trap because, I mean, think about it. You're going to get that anyway. Yeah. One way or the other. Yeah, so that's not aggressive. And sometimes if you focus on those, 
you can lose the intellectual capital or the mojo. You get busy and you pat yourself on the back for, I'm doing that little thing. I'm doing that thing and that thing's a big thing. Okay, well, how big is it? Put a number on it. Well, okay, it's, it's not as big as the original thing we're doing. Okay, well, don't kid yourself. Yeah. And but you have to be ready, though, too. You don't want to be reckless. Like, if you don't have the financial capital or the intellectual capital in yourself or your management team or the energy, you know, don't tackle something that's obviously way too big because then you'll let people down. Is, now, is, let me ask you a regular question, then let's talk about money just briefly. Is capital an excuse to not do something that's big? How much money did Viva raise again? We, we, all, we raised seven, we only used three. Okay, you only um, used three. Right. Yeah, we only we used three. We burned $3 million for night. So I, sometimes I, when I hear capital is an excuse, I wonder if the root cause is something else. Well, I, I think it clearly depends on the business, some but, type of business. Yeah. You, you're building a semiconductor factory. I think you that, 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 the, you do that without capital, that. and then you wouldn't be following the herd, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. But um, I think, so it depends on the business. And then you have to be, you know, intentional. And scarcity of capital can help you. You have to be, have enough, but you shouldn't have too much. You have to have enough to hire people to dedicate on it. That's all you need. You do need that, right? Yeah, you need that. Dedicated people. And, um, so for like Vault, what was the initial core team size? Oh, you know, again, Vault. Vault was starting off, and it was nothing at first nothing. before we hired our first person, right? So we only had quarterly goals for Vault for the first year and a half of it. And the rule was get to a dozen great people as quickly as you can, and then... After that, figure out what would be next. So it was Got it. Get that, was, to a dozen. that was the first, first base. Why a dozen? I think it's a good set of people that can kind of work together and be multidisciplinary software and engineering, product management strategy. It's sort of a cohesive group. Um, yeah. So it was get to a dozen, and hey, if we get there, figure it out what's next. Dozen. That's no, good. No long term plan. <laughs> but it was get to a dozen quick. It wasn't like, hey, let's get three people. Because otherwise it's a distraction. Yeah. Right? So if we didn't have enough money to hire a dozen great people, we shouldn't have started to do anything. Yeah. So let's just chat for a minute um, on that capital efficiency. We, it's, it's, such a, it's such a visceral thing we could spend all our time on it. But you did only burn $3 million, right? So um, what's the, what, what are the learnings there? Um, and I don't think it's all 08 and 09, although uh -huh. I, I, I suspect that's a little bit of it, right? Oh, I don't actually think it had anything to do with 08 or 09. Right, you were still right? crushing it then anyway. Well, the Doesn't thing matter. is, when we started out, I had a lot of pressure from people, including early investors and stuff, spend more, spend more, spend more. I had a lot of pressure on that. I was yeah. the guy who just didn't get it. I, was, I just didn't get it. You <laughs> I know? didn't and get it either. They, they were saying, spend more, and I, they were convinced I was the guy who just didn't get it. I was too conservative. But that's okay. You get all kinds of outside pressure and you have no chance for being great if all you're doing is following the herd, right? So I, I thought it wasn't right. I thought, no, it's, I think it's good to have top line and bottom line and I don't want to take any more money because then I'll dilute the company. Why would I do that? Why would you do it? So yeah, I just sort of, yeah. hey, we have what, you know when you're making software, they would always say, hey, change the scope or the investment or the schedule, right? but don't change them all at once. I thought, oh, we have the capital we have. Don't change that scope. Make a profitable business in the capital we have, and that's easier. It's less decisions to make. And so we set that discipline, and that just became what the thing, you know, that's just what we did. Now, I want to dig into a little bit more, but just from the, the, the physics of cash, doing bigger deals that prepay annually probably helped at the, at the yeah. margin, right? Yeah. I mean, because your, your customers did fund you. Yeah, I, right. They did. Right. Um, two things funded us. Yes, making that product. Don't so don't waste any hire. Right. I mean, don't waste any money. Be frugal. Um, get the product out quick, and sell it for a good price to as big a customer you can. Don't be too reckless, but just thread that needle. We also uh, didn't give away our people. We had uh, professional services. And we didn't give, we had a rule very early. Well, that's a good thing to chat about briefly. Very give, early in the company. I gave yeah. it away. You didn't give it away. Very right? early. I always had this mantra that, look, if our, if our people are not worth the customer paying for them, then they're not actually worth anything. Because yeah. if they're worthwhile, the customer will pay for them. So that was a rule. Hey, 
you don't give away professional services. Services have you, to be accreted. Yeah. If the, what about if the deal was going to tank? Well, then I guess the deal's going to tank because the one thing we're doing is not giving away professional services. So that's a that's just a rule. Yeah. So then that is because if you look, I haven't done the, the scientific study, but if you look at a lot of companies when they go public, services are, are loss leaders, right? They yeah. lose it's negative twenty percent margin. Yeah, you yeah. can't do it, you can't do sixty on it. But if you can make it cash flow positive, especially in the early days, that's that's a bit of magic, isn't it? It is. It yeah. is. And, and it the customers will pay if they get the value. Well, they, they, they don't they really the push value. back if the value's there, do they? Right. No, they don't, because they're generally rational, right? They if they can get more value from yes. that person, then they'll they'll do it. Um, and you have to look at yourself. If your services are not profitable, gosh, why, why cannot I make valuable enough services? Why do, why do our services cost less than the cost of our people? What, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, yeah. And it's the pressures on you. Now, if you, so it's very simple. I view it as a problem if we can't sell services because we're doing something wrong. Yeah, I think we all, you didn't, I made this mistake, a lot of us do, is we just want the customers to be happy, right? Yeah. And so subsidizing services is a natural thing to do, because if you don't provide good services, it's even worse, isn't it? Like yeah. Bad services is worse than not even closing the deal sometimes. Right, absolutely. Right? Um, but you just have to understand, hey, I'm selling a product, a product comes with a certain amount of service. Yeah. It, might, it might come with customer support, or it might come with training, or whatever you decide it comes with. Okay, you don't charge for that. But there's some things that it doesn't come with. And if you want that, you pay for that. Yeah. And you just lay it out real clearly, and, and that helps you operate. So one last question about money, and then I want to talk about stages. So you talked about in the early days when you started to take off, the investors wanted you to raise more money to go faster, right? That comes in and out of fashion. <laughs> um, we, you, do under, you resisted that. And then usually there's another time as you start to scale, whether it's 20 million, 30 million, when you really, when you wanted to pull, you want to get ahead of the curve, and also sometimes your efficiencies kind of, uh, uh, your inefficiencies increase, right? Yeah. Sales efficiency goes down, you want to start doing more on brand and other marketing that isn't uh -huh. ROI positive. Was there, did you, did, was there a moment in time there when you wanted to step on it more, or was it still organic? No, there was no moment in time where I wanted to step on it more, because yeah. I always thought, gosh, if we're building a lasting company, a lasting com company should have a, it's sort of a reasonable profit margin. One so, would hope. Software yeah. used to be really profitable in the old days, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, well. It used I to mean, just rain cash back I mean, in the days. In the long term, like you go back the last thousand years, yeah. I mean, that has been the trend. Profitable businesses, they stay in business. Unprofitable doesn't overall. That's yeah. capitalism for you. But I always thought, God, it, it's sort of like a drug. If I get on that non-profitable drug, like when it am I going to get off of it yeah. and stuff? So it just seemed like, nah, you don't do that. That's not the way to do it. Yeah. Um, so no, I was never tempted. Was pushed, right, on the IPO roadshow, and then people would say, "Hey, well, you've got X number of salespeople, 50. Why don't you just hire 50 more? You know, you'll grow 50 times. As, you'll grow, you know, twice as fast." And yeah, occasionally that works, but yeah, not usually. But I just, it didn't make sense. Okay, well, if we're on, we're running a profitable business, that was just not in the parameter. So we just. It's not important that you do all things or all things that everybody wants to yeah. do, but as a CEO, you have to decide, hey, what are you going to do? Yeah. Which, I don't know, we decided to do a certain thing. It's not that it's the best thing to do or it's the only way to do it, but we just said, hey, we're running a profitable business and we thought that was good and that's a parameter and so that's that. There's, There's no sort of two models that people come and say, ask, does, does revenue drive headcount or does headcount drive revenue? And it sounds like you're, you're squarely in the former camp that you derive headcount from revenue? No, no, no. I actually drive revenue from headcount, but I make sure I have enough stocked away. I, any revenue that's generated in Viva is because of people. Well, for sure. Yeah, and yeah. you got you to gotta hire those. If you want revenue four years from now, you got to hire those people now. Yeah. Right, yeah. we're starting right. up a brand new, probably our biggest product area to date, and this year we hired 30 people those people produce real good revenue for Viva four or five years down the road. That's when that will be a hundred plus million dollar business. But you got to hire them now. So revenue follows the people. How do you think, related to that, how do you think about how many of your sales team should perform? Like how do you think about that? Do you believe in that bell-shaped distribution? Do you in hate terms the of bell the sales, pe sales yeah. people? Uh, if, you, if you're waiting four years further and perform, it's terrible if, if, oh. if you have that attrition, isn't it? Yeah. No, I'm really thinking more about the product, the ingredients on the product people. Yeah. That's like a soup that 
that has a they, they, they start to hit their stride. A product time, has right? a four-year cooking cycle, right? It's a <laughs> soup. They're like, oh my God, I want to eat it four years from now. I got to start cooking it now. Really? That's that's not good. But yeah, product takes a long time. With sales, you know, we have a philosophy that we say we don't we don't overcover. So we want to leave top line revenue on the table. We don't want to get all the top line revenue because if we, if we push all the way for that, we will get some inefficiencies and that's not so good. But also we will get bad customer feeling yeah. because a desperate rep will do desperate things and the reps in front of the customer and they'll feel it. You don't want those desperate things, do you? No, because for us, we have many customers that are you know, they're over tw well over $20 million a year customers from us. Do we want them ever these are having infinity some... relationships, right? Yeah, this is, these are 20 year relationships. Do we want somebody in there saying, I gotta close this thing on the, my quarter because of my commission and I don't really care that you're paying us $20 million a year. So you, the way you do that is you, you don't, you sacrifice top line revenue and you don't put too many reps on there. So then the rep is not desperate. But let's, let's unpack that because that's, that's something we all think about, right? As, as founders, the war, we, don't, we don't want a bad customer experience during sales. So we struggle with this yin and yang, right? So what does that mean? Does that mean that the effective quotas are lower or does that mean it's okay to miss a quarter as long as you make the annual plan? How do you productize The way I do it is I always think um, undercover on reps. Quota and everything that comes out. Right, I always want to know I'm hiring slightly fewer salespeople and I'm sacrificing some top line revenue in the Got short it. term. Got and it. then after that, uh, the quota just comes out of the annual plan. How much do we think we're going to sell? How many people do we have? So I think it, as long as you don't overcover with reps, salespeople, are, they, they're internally motivated. They're going to want to sell more. Of so course. I've never been a... Yeah, the overcover, I, I call it lead poor, but overcover is maybe a better way to put it. Yeah. There's, a, there's an incentive to, over time, to just overcover, and that does get you the extra nickel. It does, it does get, get you the extra nickel. It does, right? that's right. But it has a cost. It has right? a cost. Um, the cost is you get sort of going on that drug a little bit, yeah. but also if you're in a business like ours, it's probably unique to ours. Right? If we were just selling payroll to thousands of companies, yeah. who cares? But might we, still be a 20-year relationship, though. Might be, but might be. this is yeah. a deep one. Like, $20 million relationship, the CEOs of these companies really know us and they expect yeah, certain things. Yeah, this is, one of, the, this is their big, one of the biggest bets they're going to make their career in software, yeah. right? Yeah, one and it affects bets. the IT and the business side. So you just can't afford that. It's more of a long-term relationship like, for example, Morgan Stanley in the banking business, right? Yeah. It's a long-term relationship that they want and they, they don't want to sub-optimize, you know, little interaction here or there. Yeah. So that's... We learned this stuff as we went along. That would be very unique to sort of Viva and our, our large customers. And interesting on that one question, quickly I want to get to some other stuff, but when you said 20 million, my limited experience in a Fortune 500 software company, what I learned is pricing's relative on these big deals. So there, was, uh, there were two pieces of software, I won't name names, but one, one you might have used to work at, and it was like 20 million a year. Uh -huh. And then there was another product, <laughs> which I won't name at all, that was almost as important. Right, but it wasn't for sales. It was for another group, and that was 18 million. <laughs> right, and if you think about who's going to like the one that's almost as important, like, but they're just bits, right? Yeah. And it, and in the day, it may cost as much to ship this Google Doc I'm looking at <laughs> as that software, right? <laughs> so, do you find that's true that it's? I mean, if Viva, if Viva can do these bigger deals, but it's because it's one of the most. It's 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 a, it's, a, it's a system of record. It's a system of managing customers. This is one of the most important things that your customers are going to buy, right? Yeah. Is it is it relative at some? Yeah, level? it's it. At the end of the day, over the long term, it'll be relative to two things. Uh, what is your competition out there, right? Yeah. Because okay, somebody else has something exactly as good as yours, and if it's sell direct, it for, yeah, yeah if it's direct. That's one thing, and then the other thing, it's related to the value. It, you can't sell it for more value than it than it provides a customer yeah. over the long term. You you can't. So the things that we sell that are quite expensive, they're probably automating and increasing the efficiency of thousands of people, right? So that's that's pretty important. That that, that adds up. Right. Um, a good example, one system we sell is about um, collaborating around clinical trials. For a life sciences company, they might, a big one might have 5,000 people around the globe collaborating on these trials in a very specific business process to get the drug approved. It really, so that's a big expense, 4,000 people. Yeah. If they don't have a good system for getting that done, 
their efficiency goes down, and if they make mistakes, they might not get their drug approved. And that's hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds, yeah, it is. Right? So you have to pick a, pick a problem worth solving that's hard, right? And My guess is I just hadn't thought, but that 20 million, it's so similar to these other 20 million price points I saw living in the Fortune 500 that it wouldn't surprise me that that would be an organic price point that if you provided enough value, right, yeah. you would end up at. But 200 million might be tough, right? Well, the thing is, <laughs> we have no one thing that's 20 million, right? We have not. lots of things. Of course things. not, but, I, but, I, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, thing. They add up. I, I don't like to, I always like to focus on the value. I do think it's interesting we're making life sciences more efficient. I can feel that only in the little 10 years that we've been operating. Yeah. And it, it actually makes a difference. It makes many people out here will, you know, one in 10 people gets a rare disease in their life. And to varying degrees of seriousness, right? And uh, l far less than half of them have effective cures. Wow. So it's kind of, it makes a it difference, cool. you know? It's pretty cool. If you ever have a person that you know and they, they don't get the right medicine, and then they do. They get, the do, they get the right medicine, you can see that difference. A lot of times that medicine was already approved three or four years ago, but somehow that person wasn't taking it. That's the inefficiency of the system. The life sciences company makes less money and the patient's not well. We're trying to make that better. Yeah. And that's a ton of value. It's huge value. It is. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great place to work. I guess that's why I work there. <laughs> do, you find, do you hire folks that are mission-driven around that? Does it, does it resonate with the average hire now? Or, is you it, know, or are they joining a software company? You know, honestly, I, yeah. I think we're just growing into the mission. At first, like I said, it? at the first, the start of the company, the mission was, let's not go out of business this quarter. Right. <laughs> that's the mission. And that then, was the mission. You yeah. know, but now we're realizing our place in the world. We can really affect change. We yeah. are respected as a company that can do what we say we're going to do. And life sciences trust us. Now we have a responsibility. So I think increasingly we are getting more mission driven. And it's really fun to see. That's like right. the transformation of Eva, right? We're becoming more mission driven. But well, that isn't, you get more mission driven over time, right? You, yeah. can, fi you can find your bigger mission over time, right? Yeah. You, you start off this atomized level and, uh, and so you go one, there. let's tie that into one topic. I want to hit two things to make sure we don't run out of time. So let's talk about how, and we can even just start right there, how the stages of Eva we chatted about before. Uh -huh. So now you're thinking about how to build a hundred year company, right? Yeah. Does that seem crazy looking back at 10 years ago? Could you, did you even think that at the founding? Did you think about building a hundred year company? Again, I'm not. I'm quarter, real, you were thinking about one quarter I, back yeah, then. Yeah, I'm real honest about that. I thought, gosh, I, I don't want to go out of business, you know. And if we don't go out of business, then we'll, then it'll be good. We'll have time to figure out what to do. And then the other inflection point was about 2010, when when we really had to look at our sales and management team. Do we really want to become a multi-product company? Because once you do that, you either crash the car yeah. or you make it big. And most likely, could have been a little smaller, but yeah, really focused. A little gone, smaller, really maybe got public, got bought and size somebody. Product is the company, but we decided in 2010, uh, we can do it. We thought we could do it. Multi-product company, which that means you're sort of on your way to a billion dollars. Yeah. Um, so that was a big phase, and now this phase is we're starting to think about mission-driven digital disruption. How do we really help you guys get into the clinical trial you you need to get into, which you know, that's pretty important if you can, both for the patient and for the life sciences company. Yeah. How can you get in the clinical trial? How can you get the right medicine? How can your doctor know about the right medicine? So that's the phase. But I would say one of the things I could, maybe I could talk about execution a little bit because I think that's underrated. If yeah. we, you know, we have time enough to go into that one. Sure, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I can maybe talk like a visionary or something like that, but I'm a Swiss American. I like trains to run on time. My parents were Swiss. It's sort of ingrained, right? Do things the right way. My dad, I don't know how many times he used to say, I'd go to him and I'd say, hey, dad, is that good enough? He'd say every time, good enough is not good enough. Meaning, if you're asking me the question, it obviously ain't good enough, right? Yeah. So I like the execution part. And it starts with picking those clear and correct target markets. That's number one. But as you scale, as you get to about 150, 200, 300 um, people, past Dunbar's number, past the number of people that you can know, 
It's this engaged teams working together. That's a core, you'll hear everybody at Viva saying that, engaged teams working together. How do I know in my company who's supposed to do what? Yeah. And this culture of managers, I trust that other team. I manage my team, which is counterintuitive, right? People want to say, hey, I got my team, I got my team. And we, we rail against those words. That's not your team. team. I hate that you. is yeah. the team that you manage. My sales, the head of sales is not on the sales team. He's on my team, and he trusts the services team, but he manages his sales team. So this engaged teams working together is really yeah, key. I love that. We actually developed an app on that because I couldn't find anything to help us do that. And so we developed an internal app. Yeah, it's called OrgWiki. You can find it out there. You can subscribe to it. You want. That's, it's been a key to our growth. And then lastly, I will say, uh, ex we say execution matters most. All that other stuff is hoo-ha. I spend 90% of my time executing. What am I going to do today, this week, this month, this year? Write down a plan, execute to a plan, measure yourself to a plan. Execution matters most. And over the long term, any good idea gets copied. Yeah. But execution is enduring. So if you start to see yourself growing, execution will matter most at the matter. end of the day. Yeah. And it's hard and it's maybe not sexy, but it's the thing that will separate you. There's a downside of capitalism, meaning there's no free lunch. If you want to be great, you have to execute. You do have to execute. So one last thing, we're over, and then uh, or one and a half last things. But related to that, so you spent how much of your time in execution, you said, 90 some odd? Yeah, probably 90. But I think you told me every three weeks you try to take a break, right? Yeah. And meet with uh, someone to challenge your thinking. Tell yeah. us quickly how you do that, because that's a great takeaway if we can all do that We later. use this term. We have a vocabulary. I, we call it the adjacent possible. I, I borrowed adjacent it. Possible. Adjacent possible. Adjacent possible. I like this, adjacent possible. And, uh, it's going to be our next book. Sorry, <laughs> I just stole on this today. <laughs> the last one was some impossible to inevitable. The first is It means take some possible. time. About every three weeks, I take about a day and yeah. I usually go to San Francisco or I'm in some other place, and I meet with people that are outside of my daily routine, but somehow adjacent. So it might be somebody that's starting a software company that's focused on banking yes. or hospitals or any number of things or somebody making a medical device or a physicist or an actual doctor or something like that, and I just force myself to talk to them and be open because otherwise you become myopic as a become CEO. myopic. Sitting and in the conference rooms, meeting the adjacent, with the same customers. Adjacent yeah. possible is a way to bridge. When a chemist talks to a physicist, something might happen. But if the chemist only talks to the chemist, yeah. that thing ain't going to happen. So you've got to make time for that and, and enjoy, enjoy that. Yeah, I love it. All right, everyone, let's give it up for Peter Gassner. I think we may have one memento of the... Do we have a memento backstage of the 10th anniversary of Eva? We may, we may not. Let's see. Do we have a cheesy memento? We may or may not. Bring out oh. the memento. Roll the prop. Oh, there we go. All right, hold on. We just have to have one toast for year 10, and then we will take a coffee break. Oh. So what, uh, what, I get to what pick color one? do you like? Yeah, I, I always uh, never follow the herd. Even take two. All right, cheers. <laughs> All right. Congratulations, cheers. Peter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you.